the picture there because before, while I was having lunch with uh, Marion and Peter, uh, we decided since it was Halloween, it might be nice to, if Peter found a Freud mask. So my son has an Einstein mask that he goes around, but we weren't successful. We couldn't find a Freud mask, so this will have to do. Uh, indeed, it's my pleasure tonight to have uh, Professor Peter Kors, who's a university professor of philosophy at George Washington University. And he's in the, um, as you probably know, the philosophy of science. He has written the philosophy of science, a systematic account, science and the theory of value, two, two centuries of philosophy in America, and most familiar to us, his book on Sartre. Uh, currently, he is working on a book called Structuralism, the Act of the Intelligible. And uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, he will speak here on whatever happened to structuralism and who needs deconstruction. This is a preview for that. <laughs> I think. Okay. Well, actually, it's the art of the intelligible. This is like the art of the possible and the art of the uh, soluble. Um, I'm sorry about the Freud mask. I mean, it was a nice idea. Uh, but uh, I did notice one nice touch coming in this evening. Some of you may have noticed it, too, that uh, Outside this building, it's announced that it's the site of the Rare Boo Library. Um, <laughs> not, rare Boos were probably, you know, very recondite Halloween greetings of some kind. Um, but, um, and there might be some dream quality to that. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, though, is uh, psychoanalysis as science, uh, about which there's been a good deal of argument recently, um, not all of it edifying. Uh, since the reason for some of it is whether uh, psychoanalysis should be paid for by uh, medical insurance policies and that kind of thing. Um, and there have been some quite, quite scandalous events uh, of uh, analysts' notes being impounded so that they can be examined in public. Uh, and there was one wonderful case in Massachusetts of a woman who apparently wanted to kill a lot of people. And, um, it was discovered who they were and <laughs> what the nature of her threats were, even though all this was supposed to be privileged. Um, but there is a question, obviously, as to uh, the status of psychoanalysis. And uh, a recent book by Adolf Greenbaum called The Foundations of Psychoanalysis has uh, reopened the debate. Is psychoanalysis a science? Freud certainly thought it was. Uh, or at all events, he thought psychology was and that psychoanalysis made contributions to psychology. And he says um, in the uh, outline of psychoanalysis that the intellect and the mind are objects for scientific research in exactly the same way as any non-human things. But of course, it's odd that he didn't give psychoanalysis the name of a science, but the name of a process. Uh, and it's an instructive name. And that'll come up a little bit tomorrow, too. I mean, uh, uh, analusis me really means loosening up. That's what it literally and strictly etymologically means, uh, loosening up. And it conveys uh, a nice sense of something like uh, disarticulation, or even one might say deconstruction. I'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. And I, I take deconstruction actually to be a very tame word, much tamer than, the, uh, um, than its current reputation would suggest. Um, the disarticulation of something with a view to its rearrangement, one might say. For me, Descartes is one of the earliest deconstructionists because of what he says at the beginning of uh, both of the meditations and of the discourse on method about uh, um, deciding to destroy all his former opinions. And if he'd only thought of deconstruct instead of destruct, as it were, de deconstruction instead of de destruction, um, he might have uh, anticipated Derrida by several hundred years. Um, but at all events, uh, one supposes, even so, if what's going on is a kind of process, that in the course of this process, one might expect to learn something about what's being loosened up or analyzed, uh, and so that might be the content of a corresponding science. And it doesn't seem extravagant to claim that Freud did learn something. He didn't just imagine he learned it. The dispute uh, in Greenbaum in particular is uh, as to the status of what he learned. Does it have scientific status or not? Um, Greenbaum, uh, some of you may know the book, uh, makes the familiar distinction between the metapsychological theory and the clinical theory, but he makes short shrift of both of them. He has massive criticisms of Freudian explanations of slips of the tongue and things of that kind. Uh, he thinks the ideological theory of repression can't possibly be sustained. Um, he uh, invents a foundation for psychoanalysis in the form of what he calls the tally argument, 
uh, which is uh, uh, from that little passage in Freud where Freud says that um, the explanation of what's going on in the patient must tally with what is real in him, assuming in that case a male uh, patient. Um, he attacks the primacy of the patient's judgment, um, which uh, Freud insisted upon. Um, and I don't think he's always fair. Uh, in particular, he, I think, misconstrues the tally argument. Um, he seems to make what is real in the patient be equivalent to what was true about the patient, which, of course, are two quite different things. That is to say, something may be real in the patient, not corresponding at all to anything anybody remembers about his or her external life. But on the whole, he makes a pretty convincing case that if you apply a certain kind of philosophy of science positivistic criteria, criterion to Freud's work, um, it doesn't stand up terribly well. Um, one might then fall back on the thought, well, um, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, it doesn't seem extravagant, for example, to claim that Freud at least succeeded in something, even if he didn't uh, learn much. Um, that is to say, he succeeded in improving the lot of some patients, at least as perceived by them. He also succeeded in doing a good deal of damage, especially when he was working with fleece on that unfortunate lady whose nose gave so much trouble. Uh, but um, uh, he improved a lot of some patients by helping them to understand themselves. Uh, there's a problem here, too, though. Um, that is, uh, there's an opposition that I find uh, trenchant in uh, dealing with psychoanalysis in general uh, between patient and agent. My own view of psychoanalysis or of any such therapy is that its aim should be to turn patients into agents. Um, and it's not clear that the comfort of the patient as patient is the desirable outcome. That is to say, what's exactly understood when the patient understands him or herself. Um, and so there are other views, and uh, Greenbaum makes uh, um, mincemeat of some of them too, um, that one might think of uh, psych uh, psychoanalysis as an interpretative system, for example, and I'll come back to that. Um, what we're left with is that it is, in fact, the practice of a therapy, and it's obviously that, um, and one might, as I say, sort of avoid the issue by um, just falling back on that. But Freud's ambition certainly is not satisfactorily represented by any such view of psychoanalysis. Freud was a neurologist, and in the Project for Scientific Psychology, the work which, uh, as everybody correctly points out, remained unpublished during his lifetime, um, and which he dropped for reasons which, when one thinks of it, are perfectly obvious. Uh, nevertheless, it was something that was really close to his heart, I think, at the time. I think he abandoned it with reluctance. Um, and he keeps coming back to it, um, sort of sotto voce, throughout his work. In the Project for Scientific Psychology, he undertook um, to develop, or um, started the attempt to develop, a total theory of mental functioning in physiological terms. Um, a theory. Uh, and I shall be um, using the word theory throughout this paper um, as the uh, characteristic mark of a science. And I'll talk a bit about the relation between sciences and theories. Um, Having a theory, I take it, means getting a coherent and, to some extent, um, authoritative view of something. And I use uh, authoritative there not to mean, uh, not to fall into a, um, a Adorno-type uh, trap, um, but to reflect the origin of the term. Um, a theory isn't just any view of something. The theoroi, as you will remember in, in Greece, were official observers. They were sent to the consultation of oracles or to the games um, to see that the oracle was correctly consulted, that the proper sacrifice was made, that the oracle really did say what, uh, or the priestess really did say what uh, um, the person making the consultation said, she said, um, because you couldn't just go and come back with an oracle and say the oracle said this. You had to have a theoros along as an official observer. Um, similarly, in the case of the games, you send a theoros with the Athenian delegation to the Isthmian games, let's say, to, to come back with the report that they really did win or lose and nobody tripped them and that kind of thing. Um, and the, the word theory, which uh, comes from, uh, among other things, I mean, partly uh, from that origin, does have a sense not just of any old uh, view of the matter, any old conjecture, but one which has uh, undergone at least some form of testing. Um, so... Uh, Theory is what one would like psychoanalysis to be. Therapy is what it certainly, at least minimally, is. Um, there's something nice about, and this is a digression which I can't resist, though. Um, there's something sacred about both of those origins. You know, the thera therapon was an attendant, um, but uh, the verb, the corresponding verb, means, among other things, to serve the gods. Um, it's the sort of thing that 
uh, Socrates no doubt had in mind in the Apology. He says, on the point of death, we owe a cock to Asclepius. And the idea that the truth has healing power um, and that uh, the truth is something godlike. Um, and the word theory itself, theoria, um, uh, has what's no doubt a f rather flaky uh, derivation, uh, um, approved of only by one or two uh, rather obscure German philologists, which I like nevertheless, which has it come from the word theos, meaning God, and the word aura, meaning care, that is, care for what the God says. So that there's a sense in which uh, there is something, um, uh, as it were, not only uh, authoritative but ceremonial about these things. Um, the relation between the theory and the therapy, or theory and praxis, uh, again, uh, is one that might be worth pursuing for a while. Uh, I think of Kant's uh, essay on the old saw that that may be right in theory, but it won't work in practice, in which he says that all true theory is useful in practice, um, and uh, by, as it were, uh, inversion, one might say, that you could sort of get uh, some theoretical, um, something of theoretical interest out of all uh, successful practice, um, but Freud uh, never did seem to quite succeed in getting these two ends together. We'll see another respect in a minute in which he didn't get two ends together. Um, and there is something in Freud also uh, which is quite the opposite of this conjecture about the ceremonial or even theological uh, um, overtones of these terms. Um, he had a kind of resolution to get results no matter what, and he quotes again and again that passage from Virgil about if I can't uh, bend things with the, uh, su the superior powers, then I'll move the infernal ones. And that's a bit of Freud's bad boy syndrome. Um, uh, I mean, he had that uh, throughout his life. Uh, and um, you, know, you, uh, you remember what a Verneinung is in Freud. It's, uh, you know, you, if, if you say, I don't mean to criticize you, but that's a Verneinung, because you know perfectly well that's exactly what you do mean. Um, and uh, Freud is always saying things like, uh, do not be alarmed, ladies and gentlemen, when he's talking about Leonardo da Vinci or something. And he means precisely to enjoy the alarm which, this, uh, uh, which his uh, delving into these uh, infernal regions produces. But at all events, um, we have in psychoanalysis uh, these two uh, lines of um, thought, uh, a theoretical one and a therapeutic one. And I want to dwell a little bit on the theory because, after all, this is question, what's psychoanalysis the science of? Oh, what makes a good theory? In particular, what makes a good scientific theory? Because uh, theory construction covers other things as well. Um, I think of the uh, linguistic function of theory construction as including the writing of novels and the telling of stories in general, um, the making of fictions, in other words, um, scientific theories being uh, fictions which once made turn out to be true of the world. You, and, uh, a theory has to be a good fiction uh, in order for it to be a good theory. First you make a world, then you see if it's like this one. Um, and the aim of theoretical work is a consistent account of the behavior of objects or processes in some domain such that given the values of some parameters, um, you can deduce others. Um, and by values here, I don't mean necessarily quantitative values. Uh, they could be behavioral or verbal. They could be parapraxies or dream reports or whatever. Um, they would, be, as it were, be values of variables, um, even though not numerical. Um, and the idea is that uh, the theory touches the world at some point. You make something like an observation at some point. You process it through the theory, and it comes out as some kind of prediction or confirmation or something of that kind. The move from fiction to science simply specifies that the values in question should be measured uh, or, since measured sounds quantitative, established by some standard observational procedure, and that the predicted uh, values should be confirmed. They shouldn't just be um, telling a story about something that has no relation to anything actual, but should actually correspond to the way the world is. Now, I said uh, that the aim of theory is a consistent account of the behavior of objects or processes in some domain, and the idea of the domain is central. You have to specify the domain in order to know what the theory is talking about. You have to identify a range of application of the theory, what objects, what observations, what measurements. If you think of physics, and Freud often compares psychoanalysis to physics, as we'll see, um, there are, for example, changes in place or configuration or temperature of material bodies whose chemical composition, when this is relevant, remains constant. Um, and it's normally possible to attribute the quality in question or the thing measured and ambiguously to the object of interest, um, it's normally possible for the parameter that's being measured to take values within some known range. 
what happens in an actual physical measurement is that the action of measurement chooses a value of the parameter. If one then calculates according to the principles of the theory, uh, what that yields is some other value of, some of the same or some other parameter or parameters, and that's how the business goes on. If you want a, a science, physics is a good paradigm case. Um, the domain then is of bodies of a certain kind, and the procedures are specified and so on. Now, there's no great claim made uh, uh, in this. It isn't that science is supposed to be some super way of doing things, a, a model for other forms of thought. Um, it isn't that science is scientistic. It's just that if you specify it correctly, it does its job in the right way. It makes, in theory, something that behaves like its counterpart in the world, at least in those places where theory and the world meet. There's a remark in Galileo, which I've always found quite striking, um, uh, about falling bodies and mathematical formulae, or types of motion, as he would say. He says, in effect, um, I'll make a formula that really fits. The really fitting was new for Galileo. That is, uh, people had um, made all sorts of conjectures before that, but he said, look, you've really got to look and see how it, how it actually goes. In the dialogues on two new sciences, he puts it this way. He says, anyone may invent an arbitrary type of motion and discuss its properties, but we've decided to consider the phenomena of bodies falling with an acceleration such as actually occurs in nature, and to make this definition of accelerated motion exhibit the essential features of observed accelerated motions. As I said, this is novel, um, and, and yet to us it seems perfectly commonplace. I mean, uh, nobody would think of um, taking seriously a science that didn't do that, um, but that had to be said pretty much for the first time. Um, what you have there, though, uh, what you have there, though, is, is, is one uh, um, acceleration, the definition of accelerated motion, that fits all. Remember, it says, this definition of accelerated motion, singular, will have it exhibit the essential features of observed accelerated motions, plural. Um, there's a class of phenomena, each limited, any member of which is matched by the definition. Um, he uses the term definition. I don't know what the... Um, uh, Latin is, but um, if indeed he wrote that book in Latin, I can't remember. Um, but the matching is all there is to it. There's no global claim about being to explain everything, uh, being, being able to explain everything. It's just that here you've got something going on in the world, here you've got something going on in theory, and there's an appropriate match over a limited and specified range in a particular domain. It's necessary to make this point because science is often accused of pretensions to uh, um, kind of taking over everything. Um, uh, there is somebody uh, who, for all I know, may be in this room, uh, who's on your faculty, I think, G.B. Madison. I mean, he's, uh, uh, at least he's connected, it's, it's said in his book, to the, in, 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 in some... A, hmm? At a sister institution. So. Uh, yes, I know, but he's on your faculty. Yeah, he's on the... And in some capacity yeah. or other. He's a master, right? But I mean, yeah, uh, anyway, um, he has a book called Understanding, in which he really takes off after science in this respect. Um, especially after people like B.F. Skinner, who did indeed uh, um, yield to that temptation. I don't want to be tarred with that brush. Um, I don't make any claim, if I'm talking about something scientific, beyond the specifications you know, within the boundary conditions and so on that I've been talking about. Science is built out from actual observations, and it's true that it enlarges its scope by hypothesis, uh, but normally you have to specify the domain when you're talking about the hypothesis as well. It's one thing to conjecture that these particular observa observations will generalize given specified circumstances. It's quite another to say that everything can be the object of such a generalizable observation. And indeed it seems clear that many things, perhaps most of the things that are of deepest interest to us, can't be made the objects of such generalizable observations. In particular, this class of non-generalizable episodes of experience includes, I should think, most cases of individual human voluntary behavior considered at any level of detail below the merely schematic. There's a question, can I, can I really possibly mean that? I mean, how about the social sciences? Aren't the social sciences sciences too? Um, and this means that I have to say something about the boundary between the natural sciences and the social sciences, a, view, uh, a, a question on which I take uh, a relatively old-fashioned view. I think it's a very sharp boundary, but I'll explain to you why. Um, in the case of Freud, obviously, the boundary is between biology and psychology. Um, and uh, uh, Freud himself, as I said earlier, and we'll have occasion to see in a minute, um, never succeeded in straddling that boundary. He starts off with biology in the um, project, but he soon gets to psychology proper um, uh, and uh, can't make the connection. I'll read you a little bit of Freud later in which he says, why not? Um, my own sense of the distinction is that the objects of the natural sciences are 
uh, objects and events whose causal antecedents don't include human intentions, and that the objects of the social sciences are objects and events whose causal antecedents do include human intentions. And although I won't for the moment spend a lot of time exemplifying that, I think you'll find this a distinction that can be made quite sharp. Um, there are purely bodily reactions, uh, reactions of humans as organisms, which clearly belong in the natural sciences and biology. Um, they are pretty complicated. They're very idiosyncratic. When you ask any pathologist whether two bodies are alike, especially if he's just had to try to find a bullet in one of them, let's say, I mean, um, uh, uh, we have a cousin who's a pathologist uh, who is constantly astonished by the idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy of bodies, e even at the biological level. But still, this variety, this idiosyncrasy, can conceivably be, be brought under categories and rules, and the whole activity of medical research is directed towards that end. But when the organism in question incorporates 30 billion largely unprogrammed neurons, it gets a little more difficult. Um, well, it could still be natural science. I mean, uh, this is an old uh, ambition since la maîtrise, uh, l'homme machine. In principle, why not? Um, the only problem is that the idea of a machine, as we know it, or as they knew it for that matter in the 18th century, of any kind of mechanism, even of an organism, just doesn't do justice to the kind of organism that has the behavioral structure that goes with 30 billion neurons. I'm not suggesting there's anything there in some sense except the 30 billion neurons, but it's terribly, terribly difficult to get scientific generalizations of the physics kind out of that. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going into the business of exactly what human intentions are. I take them to be, as you'll see in a minute, the perfectly natural function of a body with 30 billion neurons. I mean, maybe we should just go on to ask. I mean, how does a body that incorporates 30 billion neurons behave? Um, and one answer is, well, it's conscious and purposive and emotional and calculating. Uh, that is, uh, that's what bodies that complex do. They behave like us. We are them. And I want to make a, a insert a word here about the mind-body problem, um, because obviously that's what's uh, um, aroused by these remarks. Um, it always seems to me necessary to specify which mind-body problem you mean if you're talking about the mind-body problem. There's the mind-dead body problem, and there's the mind-live body problem. Um, the mind-dead body problem is really quite a problem, um, and it's a problem really about what life is. Um, and life is a cyclic, metabolic, self-reproducing process, etc., etc., and that's less and less of a problem as time goes on because we're finding more and more about how that works. But the mind-live body problem doesn't seem to me a problem at all. Um, because mind, that is feeling, thinking, wondering, expecting, judging, comparing, calculating, and so on, just is one of the functions of a live body of sufficient complexity, like breathing and digesting and walking and feeling pain and hearing and speaking. Um, that is, uh, there's, here I am, a live body incorporating uh, not 30 billion neurons, but the remnants of the 30 billion neurons that I had at birth, um, but it's just me as I am, including the things I do. It's not something else. Um, uh, I'm reminded, I suppose, it must have been because I was on the plane to Toronto this morning that I made this note in the margin that we recently saw some movies of Glenn Gould playing the piano. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hands on the piano. It's not the hands and playing the piano. Um, so it isn't mind and matter uh, as such. You might want to say mind and organized complex matter, but then you really ought to suppress the and and replace it by is. As I say, what I take it mind is, is uh, um, part of the living function of suitably organized, suitably complex matter. Um, I can't resist quoting about materialism, because obviously that's what is um, being slipped in here, a remark of the French biologist uh, Jean Rostand, when somebody said, did he think that mind came from matter? And he said, of course, but I've never pretended to know what matter was. Um, and uh, it does seem to me that, you know, if you distinguish between the mind dead body and the mind live body problem, you can get rid of quite a lot of philosophical complexity fairly easily. Now, um, another answer, though, to the question of how does a body that incorporates 30 billion neurons behave is that it behaves uniquely. Um, there's a radical idiosyncrasy of the human subject we know there's a radical idiosyncrasy, genetically speaking. No two uh, um, neonates are alike unless they're identical twins, even genetically. And as to experientially, it's quite clear that before very long, even twins, even identical twins, have quite different syntagmas of experience. Um, since experience has a microstructure, uh, a bit of experience lasts a fraction of a second, I suppose. 
um, and this goes on all the time from conception to death, um, there's this uh, uh, kind of syntagmatic possibility which is astronomically larger than the possible numbers of cases, the possible numbers of humans, and no two segments of experience are alike, uh, let alone uh, no two people. You also have the fact that in the social sciences um, and in human beings in general, there exist all sorts of feedback loops because of reflexive uh, language and so on, and there exist uh, varieties of situation. Um, so it looks as though no social science is possible, uh, certainly let alone any social science which would go by the name of psychoanalysis. But on the other hand, social sciences are possible, and the answer to the question how they're possible, since the foundation of the Geisteswissenschaft in just about is, that on top of this um, uh, uh, radical idiosyncrasy get superimposed common interpretative structures, among which uh, there's uh, language. Um, and that these structures make possible a reconvergence after genetic and experiential divergence and are helped, we're helped in being like one another and being able to co communicate with one another by other features of the social apparatus, like the fact that these things are passed on from generation to generation and to some extent encoded in what Sartre would call the practico inert. I'm not saying, of course, that no positivistic social science is possible. Of course it's possible on condition of remaining, as I said before, at the level of the schematic, or sometimes of remaining at the level of the anonymous, um, or perhaps just by doing it unobtrusively. Um, my colleague Amitai Etzioni was telling me the other day about something that social scientists are talking about these days called unobtrusive observation. Unobtrusive observation is the kind of observation you get to make, as it were, by accident without actually planning it. And his case was um, uh, about a fire in a dormitory at Columbia. And when the fire alarm was sounded, that was a men's dormitory, 500 men came out, but also 40 women came out. Um, and he said this was an unobtrusive observation about, you know, the habits of people in this particular Columbia dormitory. Um, <laughs> I asked him who'd started the fire, but he uh, um, rejected the thought that any social scientist would. Because uh, you see, uh, that would still be unobtrusive even if you started the fire, because you aren't really interfering with the social um, phenomenon in question. Um, so um, there are, however, I mean, as I say, if you have positivistic social science in which you treat the so social like the natural, like the practical inert in such a sense, the stuff you come across and can measure. And um, that's, uh, that's okay, you can do that. You get lots of statistics about marketing and things like that, but it's not really very theoretically interesting. Um, and uh, the more interesting kind of thing is when you have common interpretative structures so that you get this convergence, people uh, learn them and, and as it were, come to belong to them, um, and you get essentially structuralist, that is, non-positivist theories of language or kinship or mythology or literature and politics and so on. Um, in which it looks as though because of the fact that people get acculturated, what one individual does is likely to be a transform of what some other individual in the specifiable group does, and what the whole group does is likely to be a transform of what some other group does, and so on. So that what we have are, roughly speaking, positivist and realist natural science, as they, because you can think of the world as being some way, but roughly speaking, structuralist and idealist social science. I say idealist, uh, realizing the risk I take, um, because structures uh, in the social sciences are systems of relations that mutually transform, but they are created and sustained by the intentionalities of human subjects. However, these are individual subjects. I mean, they're, 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 they're um, passed from subject to subject. They're not found by subjects in some ideal realm. They, they aren't thought by God or the absolute or mind with a capital M. They're thought by individuals. But nevertheless, they have the status of um, uh, ideal objects, or one might better say intentional objects in Brentano's sense, rather than real objects. But in either case, whether you're talking about positivistic natural science or structural social science, you still have to specify the domain. In either case, you make observations and entertain hypotheses. Um, in the uh, social science case, they won't be causal hypotheses, though, by and large. They'll be, roughly speaking, hermeneutic hypotheses. That is, not will it happen, but does it make sense? You aren't going to use these things for prediction. You're going to use them for accommodation of things into a system. Although, of course, it's also true that if you have a hermeneutic hypothesis, that is, uh, if you um, claim that some arrangement is going to make sense to people, something may then be made to happen by the people who see the sense it makes, which is why social sciences are often causally powerful after all. That's if you can convince enough people of, some, uh, of something, they, since they are natural objects in a natural world and have energy at their disposal and so on, may do something about it. Um, and I have a, a tiny quotation from Levi Strauss uh, um, on this general topic where he says, the real question is not whether the touch of a woodpecker's beak does in fact cure toothache, it's rather whether there's a point of view from which a woodpecker's beak and a man's tooth can be seen as going together, 
the use of this congruity for therapeutic purposes being only one of its possible uses, and whether some initial order can be introduced into the universe by means of these groupings. That is, um, that's the end of the quotation, whether the world we make out of this relation is a plausible one, um, leaving for later the question whether it might turn out to match some aspect of this world. But the thing is that even in the social sciences it might well be that an interpretative structure did in fact match some aspect of people's behavior or discourse or something of that kind, even though you couldn't attach it to that discourse in the way in which you'd want to attach a natural science to observations in the natural sciences. Now the question is whether psychoanalysis is one or another of any of these kinds of science or kinds of theory that I've been uh, discussing. Certainly not a positivistic and realist natural science, even though that's what Freud envisaged in the project. Um, and why not? Um, I mean, there surely are neurons, and they're real. And the, 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 say the neurons are not uh, are objects uh, among whose causal antecedents are human intentions. Um, so why couldn't you have a plausible natural science model? And the answer to that, I think, is that it uh, has to be schematic, as I said before. There's too much to be born by too much detail to be borne by too simple a model, too much observational detail to be borne by too simple a model. If the domain of the theory is neurons, then you can get some simple loops um, and um, you know, even now computer modeling and that kind of thing. Uh, Freud has some nice simple loops in the project. They're very, very um, primitive, but then Sherrington had only just named the neuron a couple of years before he wrote the project. Um, now we can certainly have lots of neurophysiology um, and you can get um, simple or maybe even relatively complex uh, phenomena now, but that's not human behavior, that's just neuronal behavior. If the domain is human behavior, then the problem is that each subject, each behaving subject, has 30 billion neurons or the residue thereof, and each slice of the behavior of that subject is mediated by some considerable subset of these 30 billion, arranged not only in genetically but also in epigenetically structured complexes, the details of which are completely inaccessible to us. And the epigenetic, epigenetic point is obviously terribly important because um, even if uh, people started with identical brains, which they don't, um, uh, experience uh, learning of one kind or another would soon establish connections, um, which are probably, as far as that's concerned, themselves quite idiosyncratic in spite of the fact that we wind up living in the same world and speaking the same language. I mean, it's entirely probable that if one of us could be wired into the head of another, we'd just have nightmares and not be able to understand uh, anything of what was going on. Um, because it's like, um, uh, you know, personal computers, that's a model you can think of now. Um, you know, if I, if I have an address in my computer, I may put something in it quite different from what you put in the com comparable address in your computer. And it may well be that the place in my 30 billion uh, complex where I store, let us say, the um, uh, code for... Uh, Freud is a place where you store the code for butterscotch ice cream or something of that kind. I mean, it, uh, there's absolutely, um, it's like telephone numbers and things like that. I mean, there, there need be no intelligibility whatever to the actual disposition of, 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 of um, uh, relationships, physi physiological relationships, provided that there's this convergence into common interpretative systems at the appropriate point. So you scrap that, as Freud did. Um, it's not that there's no causal connection between the neurons and the behavior, it's just that it would be helpless to specify it. Um, Freud says, this is a quote, we know two kinds of things about what we call our psyche or mental life. Firstly, it's bodily organ and scene of action, the brain or nervous system, and on the other hand, our acts of consciousness, which are immediate data and cannot be further explained by any sort of description. Everything that lies between is unknown to us and the data do not include any direct relation between these two terminal points of our knowledge. If it existed, it would at the most afford an exact localization of the processes of consciousness and would give us no help towards understanding them. Our two hypotheses, and he has two, um, start out from these ends or beginnings of our knowledge. The first, and this is still Freud, the first is concerned with localization. We assume that mental life is the function of an apparatus to which we ascribe the characteristics of being extended in space and of being made up of several portions, which we imagine, that is, as resembling a telescope or microscope or something of the kind. Notwithstanding some earlier attempts in the same direction, the consistent working out of a conception such as this is a scientific novelty. It's the end of the quote. Um, there's, a, again, the claim to scientific status. It is quite extraordinary that you, you, he should use the image of the telescope or microscope, not only because of its sort of scopic features, um, but because it's not there, obviously, just a question of regions, which is the way the topographic uh, view usually goes, but a question, as it were, of actual moving parts, um, which is very strange. I don't know how Freud actually envisages this stuff. Anyway, the domain of the science in this case is purely conjectural. It consists of the id and the ego and all the rest of it. 
So our question might then be, is the story that Freud tells about them plausible? Is it a candidate to be a story, a fiction about our world, rather than about a purely fictional one? And again, the difficulty is, as it was in the case of Galileo, remember, one definition of motion fits all the motions. So um, it's not the id or the ego, there's no such thing, but it's mine or yours or his or hers. And in the case of physics, there's one world in which every accelerated motion fits the pattern. And we want to ask then, do we mean for psychoanalysis one world in which every id fits the pattern? What's the analogue of the motion in the Galileo case? What's the observable component? Because we need not just a class of conjectural or hypothetical objects, but a class of phenomena. Because we might ask, well, so what the patient say? You know, Lacan's notion of the word of the patient. But it's difficult to make all that into a class. Every utterance is different. Any attempt to classify will involve interpretation. There's a kind of microcosm of what I said about the social sciences emerging through interpretative structures uh, in Freud's notion of the relation between the primary and the secondary processes. You remember the primary process is completely lawless in the id. It becomes secondary precisely by the emergence of language. Uh, that is, that um, uh, the process assumes linguistic form in the preconscious. Um, uh, uh, Freud says. So you might think you could have a science of psychoanalysis of a hermeneutic uh, uh, kind, um, which is the kind of thing that Ricoeur and Habermas both say it is, and they get, again, short shrift from Greenbaum in that book. Um, uh, he's quite merciless uh, with, with Habermas in particular. Um, but even if you could make it into a kind of structural or social science like that, that certainly is not what Freud would have wanted. In fact, he seems to stick to a version of the physiological doctrine all the way through. Uh, as late as 1940, he's saying, it's generally agreed, another quote from Freud, it's generally agreed that conscious processes do not form unbroken sequences which are complete in themselves. There would thus be no alternative left to assuming that there are physical or somatic processes which are concomitant with the psychical ones and which we should necessarily have to recognize as more complete than the psychical sequences, since some of them would have conscious processes parallel to them, but others would not. That is, there's this underlying brain stuff, in effect, and consciousness only um, uh, crops up occasionally. If so, Freud continues, it of course becomes plausible to lay the stress in psychology on these somatic processes, to see in them the true essence of what is psychical, and to look for some other assessment of the conscious processes. The majority of philosophers, however, dispute this and de declare that the idea of something psychical being unconscious is self-contradictory. But that's precisely what psychoanalysis is obliged to assert, and this is its second fundamental hypothesis. We had the other one earlier. It explains the supposedly somatic concomitant phenomena as being what is truly psychical, and thus in the first instance disregards the quality of consciousness. Now there may be something wrong with that translation, there often is, and I haven't checked the German. But to say psychoanalysis explains the supposedly somatic concomitant phenomena as being what is truly psychical is a wild misuse of the word explains um, in any normal um, um, context in English. Um, and to call them phenomena is another wild misuse, because these somatic things precisely are not phenomenal from the psychoanalyst's point of view. They're what doesn't show up in um, conscious processes, um, uh, except indirectly and, and, and conjecturally um, in dreams and things like that. That's the kind of thing that makes critics very unhappy. Um, and one understands Greenbaum's impatience with the whole thing. But still, none of these criticisms really deprives the psychoanalytic account of a possible plausibility, a possible ordering of the world. It's certainly not a science in the strongly confirmed sense, but it seems to be one that in the hands of therapists helps in conceptualizing the structures in patients that lead to pathological behavior, or that in the hands of analysts helps in conceptualizing structures in agents. Um, I make the distinction between therapists and analysts there quite deliberately. One supposes that therapy is for th those who are in some way um, uh, pathological in their behavior, but there's no earthly reason why a perfectly normal person shouldn't simply out of curiosity decide to go into analysis um, and uh, help to conceptualize, um, the, the theory might help to conceptualize structures there too. Um, but of course it may be, uh, uh, this is a possibility, I was thinking uh, for some reason of Tolstoy's opening um, um, sentences in Anna Karenina but he says all happy families are alike, and that all unha each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. It may be that all healthy subjects are alike, but all pathological ones are pathological in their own way. I don't know. Uh, um, the healthy are alike, one supposes, or the ones that are thought to be healthy are alike, because of the um, convergence of interpretative structures, which enables them to function in the same world. Um, but in the pathological cases, or even in, as far as that's concerned, in the healthy cases, it's still terribly unsatisfactory because there are different readings of case material, even by experienced analysts. So my question now, and this is heading towards the uh, 
uh, point of the talk and the end, because the point and the end come at the same time, um, is there perhaps another way of thinking about this whole question? Um, suppose we go back to the 30 billion neurons and uh, think of the prima facie implausibility of any regularity in events whose causal antecedents pass through different sets of these 30 billion in different circumstances at different times. Suppose we decided just to work with one set, with an individual patient. Suppose we were to say that psychoanalysis is the science of his or her world, not of the whole world. Because there's certainly enough variety in the individual world. And in fact, there's a sense in which, and I don't really have time to pursue this, um, no, nobody can have a conception even of the totality of the physical world, the cosmos, the universe, that is more complex than the carrying power of that person's neurological apparatus. If you think of it, as I say, this is the, in, in a way you could get a kind of Heideggerian um, um, uh, complementarity of ego and world out of this. But it really does seem to be literally true um, that there's no, uh, uh, no possible way in which I can imagine a world more complex than a world I can imagine, which sounds tautologous, but is pretty profound when you think of it, because there are no worlds which are not somehow, there are no worlds known to us which are not known by somebody or imagined by somebody. Um, there's enough variety, then, in the patient's world, but the real problem is there's not enough evidence. That is, it's very hard to make the measurements which would be necessary, make the observations which would be necessary to establish this science. But that's why psychoanalysis takes a long time. The evidence has to be amassed. Um, that's why dreams and parapraxies and jokes are important. That's why free association is important. That's why um, analysands go four times a week and so on. Because the job of the analyst is to accumulate evidence from that idiosyncratic world in order to build a theory on it. That is at least what I'm claiming here. Um, a long time ago, I... Uh, found a sort of aphoristic formulation about what I thought science was. I, science is the explanation of nature in its own terms. Um, and that still seems to me reasonable. Um, maybe the individual is equivalent to the whole of nature, as it were. Maybe it's enough to have one id, one ego, one superego, and whatever else there is, one network of interconnections which produces original and unique patterns of behavior. So the analyst, as scientist, has to draw his or her explanatory material in the first instance from the patient's own discourse and behavior. Um, he or she can't impose any a priori conception um, because a tested empirical result in anybody else's world or in the social world in general can only be a priori in the patient's world until it's empirically tested in that world. It's not clear that anything is necessarily going to be the case except in the most obvious sense that if you hit the patient with a club, uh, he or she will become insensitive or insensible, um, that sort of thing. But when it comes to the details of voluntary behavior, it's not clear that anything is to be assumed from the beginning. And in this way, there's a sense in which psychoanalysis can be a science and a quite rigorous one. Its domain is the utterances and actions of a particular real person. Um, the data obtained from these utterances and actions may be generalizable, but only within the world of that uh, subject. There's no automatic trans-world generalization. So what psychoanalysis is the science of is the psychic life of the individual. But not, see, the individual already sounds like something general. Um, there's no such thing as the individual. There are only individuals. A different science for each individual, not just a different bunch of data to be interpreted by the same science. By this I mean that the relations uh, may be different, there may be new forms, old forms may be missing. Sartre says somewhere, I have no superego. Well, that makes him an interesting candidate right off, you know. Um, and there are certainly people who don't seem to have egos, or at least not um, uh, you know, autistic people, schizophrenic people, and so on. But the thing is, if you were to take this rather bizarre view, which I do take very seriously, that if there's such a thing as a science of psychoanalysis, or if psychoanalysis is a science, it's only ever the science of an idiosyncratic world. How do you train people to do it? How can you uh, train analysts? Well, there's a nice book by a uh, philosopher, I think he's at Syracuse, Jose Benedetti, called Infinity, um, in which he entertains the following hypothesis. He says, suppose you put people in a rocket. Um, this book is all about Zeno's paradoxes and things, and I won't go into its details, but he says, suppose you put people in a rocket that went one mile in the first half minute, two miles in the second quarter minute, four miles in the, in the, in the, in the next uh, eighth of a minute, and so on. Um, when you got out of it at the end of a minute, uh, when the people got out of it, Benedetti says, they would have to say, where in the world are we? Um, and, of course, they wouldn't be in the world because they would have, as it were, have gone infinitely far. 
Um, and one might imagine um, sending people off on missions in this infinity rocket, they, they would wind up in places which didn't necessarily bear any resemblance to this world at all. Um, I think uh, when a patient walks into an analyst's office, it's a little bit like the analyst going on a mission to an as yet un unknown world. Um, nothing is to be assumed. Um, unfortunately, the world of the patient can't be explored as this world, our ordinary world has been. This world has been explored by thousands of investigators over many generations. We were hearing just now uh, from Hugh Kenna um, some of the questions that were asked by people uh, when the Royal Society was first founded. Do diamonds regenerate? You know, uh, do horns grow in the ground? All sorts of things like that. Millions and millions of silly questions had to be asked in order to begin asking the correct ones. Um, you don't have time for that in the world of the patient. The complexity of that world might warrant.